So I wanted to very quickly get us started. Um, this has been sponsored by the Houston chapter of HFES. I'm the current president for the Houston chapter. Um, we also had this arranged with our program director, who is Cynthia Rando, and our webmaster, Andy Muttermer, is our host right now. You can see our um, Twitter contacts up there. If you're interested in um, following us or learning about us, we have a website, we have a LinkedIn group, a Facebook page, and um, also a Twitter. So there's the information about the group. Uh, I wanted to thank Robin Richter. She did a really great job of keeping up with everybody's RSVPs. So we really appreciate that. And also I wanted to thank Liz Rodwell. She's from the uh, Houston UXPA group and she cross posted this and made it sort of a joint uh, event. And I really appreciated that to get the word out. And she is um, also hosting another event. If you wanna look up Houston UXPA, they're doing another joint event on June 2nd, and that's also talking about remote interviews. So um, very relevant, very timely stuff. So um, Andy, do you have anything to share or are we all set? Oh, I think we're good. Um, maybe if you're not a panelist, um, you could remember to mute yourself until we get to the questions and um, maybe turn off your video if, if you don't want. I know I'm gonna turn mine off. Okay. That's great. So I'll go ahead and introduce Landon. Landon's going to be our moderator. Um, well, actually, I'll let you introduce yourself and then you can have the panelists introduce themselves and then we can just get going. Take it away, Landon. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm Landon. I'm an intern at End End Use Research with Christy. Um, but now I want each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, as we go through and kind of give a history of their job, what their job role is right now, their education and some of their past jobs or internships they had in the past. And I guess we'll go ahead and start with Eric. Sure. Can you guys hear me? We can. Well, great. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Eric. My uh, first job ever was to dance up, dance on a street corner dressed up as a mailbox. So I did that for uh, $10 an hour under the table when I was about 12, which uh, I think gave me uh, two times my weekly allowance in just one hour. Um, but I changed my major in undergrad three times. Uh, eventually landed on cognitive science. I studied uh, human factors and ergonomics in grad school. And my final project was uh, investigating the ergonomic risks associated with uh, brewing beer and, and commercial breweries. I just wanted to drink beer during my project. Um, I graduated in 2008, which at the time was a terrible time to graduate. I took a job in an accounting firm uh, before I eventually jumped into the, the, the world of user experience. Uh, started my career as a researcher, joined IBM about five years ago, and I, I started and lead a research org of about 75 people. And we all uh, work on IBM's cloud and data platforms. Got uh, three kids. And if I wasn't on this panel right now, I'd be doing slip and slide with them because it's, uh, it's about 96 degrees out in the Bay Area. So that's me. Nice, nice. And then uh, Hannah. OK. My background is a lot less interesting, um, but you know, way to get the ball rolling. Um, currently, I'm at the end of my interview process. Um, so unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, was laid off. So um, at the end of interviewing, which is great, very exciting, um, I have my bachelor's in psychology and I got my master's in applied cognitive um, and human factors. Um, my two UX um, roles, I started my internship at HP and was there for a year and a half working on customer facing products like laptops, keyboards, mice, backpacks. Um, then I switched over to the software side with internal software for corporate IT with ExxonMobil and did all the, did redesign work for um, internal software. So things like payment systems and project management tools. Um, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Awesome, awesome. Now, Michael. Hi, hi I'm Michael Pickett. Um, I got my bachelor's in psychology and then got my master's in human factors at UHCL. Um, 
I'm currently working as a UX researcher at Grinnell Mutual in Iowa. And um, prior to that, I interned and then worked at end-to-end -end user research along with uh, Landon and Christy. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty brief overview. Awesome. Uh, Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Please call me Liz. Um, and I was um, a Bachelor of Science, our Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, and then I became a Master of Science in Cognitive Psychology. And I transitioned from academia as what I like to call a failed academic because I didn't finish my PhD program, didn't like it, wasn't for me, um, into industry where I started um, in Houston at Chai One as a UX researcher, um, worked my way up to lead and then transitioned into uh, Alexa for Amazon where I'm uh, during the COVID pandemic and I am um, getting ready to move from Houston to Seattle for that position. Uh, I started my career early doing different sorts of crazy odd in jobs too like Eric, but some of those are kind of funny. Um, not something we're really gonna talk about here, but also a uh, avid roller derby fan. Probably not going to talk about that here either, but some flavor doesn't hurt. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Matab? Mm. Is he not here? Andy, was Matab here? Yes, she was. Oh. Let me see if I can unmute her. I can only ask to unmute um, and ask to turn on video. Sorry about that. Always a little bit of technical difficulties in the beginning. When we carry on. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll go into our first question we have. And that is, what has stood out to you during the current hiring process during COVID? And for this, I think we'll start with Michael. Okay. So, um, for me personally, it really increased the urgency for me. Um, moving from Houston to Iowa while all the shutdowns were starting um, really moved up a lot of timelines sooner for me. Um, so I knew that both myself and Grinnell Mutual were trying to figure out how things were going to play out since it's such an uncertain time. And so um, really just being um, adaptable in that process, I think, was really important for me. Awesome. What about you, Liz? I would say for me, it was really how the communication style changed, not really the type of communication, because where I was applying, um, being Alexa, we communicated mostly via emails and uh, phone already, but the the depth and the frequency had to change just because everybody was trying to figure out how to adjust and how to react to the pandemic in general. So I was speaking to a recruiter or to members of my team um, less frequently because they were having to deal with more emergent situations. Um, but when I was speaking to them, the quality of those conversations became more important and the length of those conversations became longer because we were trying to get to know each other or figure out certain situations. So typically when you're going through those types of recruiting conversations, they seem almost perfunctory. Uh, there are certain things, certain details that you have to get out of the way where these became more important to understand and um, ask certain questions, get into the root of certain situations and understand more uh, 
quality answers and questions about what would you do and how would you do certain things just because of what was going on in the world. Awesome, awesome. And I think we have Metabs back in. So I'm going to have to let you introduce yourself and go ahead and tell us about your current job role, your uh, ed past education, and then your past jobs that you've had. Yeah, of course. I'm sorry, I had internet difficulties. Um, so right now I'm a I'm a senior design research manager at eBay. I lead the buyer experience research. And prior to that, for five and a half years, I was at Apple, uh, where I started as a researcher, human factors researcher, and then transitioned into a manager role within the same org, uh, managing a research team for three years. And then before that, um, I completed my PhD um, at Wisconsin Madison, again, doing human factors. Um, so that's for the intro. And then the question was about any differences in the interview process, right? Mm -hmm. what, what has stood out to you during this, the new, the current hiring process? Uh, well, I think what has been very different is that a lot of folks in the market are very much more purposeful with what they're doing. I, and I think I, this is an interesting, this is an observation that I've I've, I've had elsewhere too, like even in like housing market. Uh, people who are in the game tend to be very serious about it on the hiring side and also the candidates. This is like for some reason, at least like during the first two or three months, it, it hasn't been a period of exploration, which I would encourage folks to, to, to look into as well, but it has been more about folks that are like very serious on the hiring side again and both um, finding a new job. Awesome, awesome. So Eric, what do you, what has stood out to you? Well, let me share a quick story that maybe is a little different than what the panelists before me have talked about. Um, I had been trying to recruit an employee of one of our competitors companies since before COVID. And uh, we were getting close to making a deal. And then COVID started ramping up and the individual was apprehensive about changing companies in this time. So one of the decisions I made is I actually flew down to Austin, which is Austin, Texas, where they were based, and met with them in person because up until that point, it had all been over remote. And it was prior to the shelter in place regulation. Uh, and I still believe that that decision to go connect with them face to face uh, is what led to their confidence in, in moving over and, and joining my organization. So. That was uh, a different experience than uh, what I've what I've done in prior hires. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you, Hannah? So I would say the dynamic of interviewing is definitely a lot different. Um, I've got to the on-site stage of interviewing um, during this whole remote thing, and companies are doing on-site interviews remotely which means all day long, six hour interviews back to back, just like you would be doing um, during an actual um, onsite, but now they're transitioning that to virtual, which is very exhausting, but um, it is different. It's different to sit in front of a computer screen and introduce yourself and try to get to know the person on the other side and the job opportunity through a computer screen, because it's different than shaking someone's hand or getting to eat lunch with them and understanding their hobbies um, outside of work and how the work culture is, because you're not actually there. Um, so yeah, I think um, the, the first interview I did all day, I was like six hours, like how are you gonna do six hours of interviewing? And that's, they're really doing that. So um, just be prepared for that. Um, mentally it's exhausting like I said but um yeah the dynamic of interviewing just as a whole is just really different now um because companies are trying to adapt to this remote environment yeah definitely so uh, now for our second question is how has the interview process changed or how have you adjusted your hiring process for the company compared to the past so anything that so kind of like what you're saying, Hannah, about being a longer process all online, how have you adjusted to that personally? 
Yeah, so um, I've definitely spent time researching etiquette virtually, which may sound funny, but um, it's just different. Um, like I said, when you walk into a on-site interview, you know, you're being judged as soon as you walk in, you know, the way you sit, the way you talk, how you shake someone's hand. So it's definitely a different, you just pop onto the computer screen and they're immediately, you're part of the interview. Um, so I've definitely spent time researching um, different things about um, interviewing remotely. Um, definitely spent a lot of time um, thinking through problems of what would happen um, with troubleshooting. So fortunately, I haven't had any issues, but during the interview process, I have had in interviewers have to log in and out because of their connection. And we're all going through this at the same time. So it's really, you know, no one's panicking or um, they're, you know, they're so understanding about it's okay, like we'll work through it. Um, but I would just say be prepared for the worst, um, just stay calm and definitely trouble troubleshoot when needed. Um, technology wants to work when it works. So um, it's definitely what we have to rely on right now um, during this process. Um, Michael, how's that? How's the process changed for you? How have you adjusted to it? Um, so I've had a pretty similar adjustment. Um, another thing that I've done that may sound kind of silly, but um, I spent a while making sure that the background behind me, like not here, but when I was uh, still in Houston, that it looked somewhat professional, just because like what Hannah was saying, you know, you, you are being judged right off the bat and you want to put your best self forward. It's just a lot different um, when you're looking at a computer screen. Um, and then again, like what Hannah said, with being prepared, I would have a, a few headsets next to me just in case one wasn't working right, you know, um, I'd be testing my internet connection um, and things like that. And just, just trying to make sure that I was prepared and that I was putting my best self forward. All right, Ms. Liz, how did you adjust? So for me, I'm, I'm very much a extroverted person. So I used to very much rely on physical presence. Um, it wasn't that I didn't prepare. It's just I also prepared relying on the fact that I would be in the room with someone. So much like Hannah, it's a different type of preparedness. So you have to very much think on your feet and prepare mentally and to engage in very much a different way because you can't rely on that human connection. Um, you're having to almost simulate it in a way that's virtual and we do that somewhat at the beginning stages of interviews but when you have to start doing a deeper level of engagement and starting to um, really dive into the depths of how to clearly prepare and answer ans um, answer answers but engage in answers with what could be your future colleagues it takes a really different level of preparedness you have to really set out different types of situations and think about how you would lay out what you would prepare, what types of situations you would go through and really have different sets of stories that you can tap into um, that you could engage in more on a verbal side and less so on a human element where in a room and we can connect on that level side. So it was prepping in that way. Yeah, awesome. Um, Eric, how, is, how have you adjusted to the new hiring process? Sure. Well, one of the things is I put up a virtual background. It's kind of silly, but hey, this is what our office looks like. You know, the one that you would join whenever that is. Uh, or I'm more likely to share my screen during the interview and say, here's our chart or our values or, you know, uh, here's the product UI or blah, blah, blah. You know, kind of show them things. Um, the overall process is faster. You know, we've, we've shortened the decision from you've got a hiring requisition to we've got an offer and a, a confirmed uh, person. But some of the discussions are longer, as Liz alluded to earlier. You know, if, if, if things are going well with a particular candidate, we'll often run over the scheduled time for that meeting. Um, getting more people involved with remote group interviews. So instead of just doing a one-on-one, -on -one, I might pull in two or three people. Uh, as you know, being able to work remotely with, with uh, a variety of folks is really important now and in the future. Uh, a little more flexibility in the hiring location. 
uh, for you candidates out there, paying a lot of attention to the use of pronouns. You know, how much are you saying we versus I? You know, because that becomes critical in establishing your ability to team. Um, and I would say also a little more casual. Uh, so for example, some of my interviews, uh, we decided to take a walk. It's like, hey, forget sit in front of my computer here. Let's hop on the phone and we'll just go walk around our neighborhoods together. Uh, so those are a few. Awesome, awesome. How have you adjusted the tab? Um, I think like really what I heard from the other panelists, all of that applies. It's, I mean, in all those ways, but I think one of the most important things as folks on the side that I am, which is like the interviewers, is to understand how taxing it can be for the interviewee to just like sit through like six of these calls back to back. I think um, it's a bit different from when we did it in person because I mean you basically out of respect for the candidate's time you want to be, be able to say okay come in at this this hour and we'll send you out in like three to four hours we've collected all the feedback now I feel like it's actually better to do it maybe in chunks make sure that there are breathers in between because it's not the same thing like the human connection that you have when you're sitting in the in the same room and then you have a lunch break you go in and out that's that's different and it's I mean being a candidate it's harder to voice those concerns. So I think it's more on the recruitment side for us to be cognizant of how, how it's just difficult to stay focused and engaged for those hours. But I think on the plus side, what we gain in, in a world that's actually like moving very quickly uh, in the virtual direction, uh, we all get a good understanding of how we will be able to collaborate once we actually have to do it that way. And in a way, it's an equalizer because now you don't have to be in my city, in my climate, in my whatever to, to, to work with me. Now you can be somewhere else and we can coordinate. So that, that is also something to consider on the plus side. Awesome, awesome. And before we move on to our, our next question, I wanna remind everyone that if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or message me privately and we'll, we'll have a time at the end to get the, our audience questions out there. But this question uh, is for the people who are onboarding employees or who have started a new role. Um, what has it been like to start as an employee or what's it been like to start a, to start up a new employee at first of starting a new role um, as, as a remote worker? Um, and I guess we'll start with Michael, how, how have you, how has that process been for you to start a role being remote? Um, so it's definitely different. Um, getting to know everyone virtually just doesn't have that same feel of um, getting to know people in person. Um, it's strange, the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, I do feel like I know them, but I still don't actually know them. It, it's, just, it's just a bit of a weird feeling. Um, and um, another thing that was kind of challenging was moving so far like I did and then trying to get a home office set up. Um, they also weren't immediately able to um, provide me with a work computer, so they set me up with a virtual machine. And so, it, again, just adaptation. Um, I, I've had to adapt to a lot, but they've been really helpful with it, and um, I've, I've had a good experience. Um, considering the circumstances. Yeah, awesome. So Liz, how, how have you, uh, how has your startup as a new role been remotely? I think overall it's been really positive. It's been something that generally has been a, a, a motivating challenge for me because it's made, forcing me to put myself in a position of relating in a way that's different for me because I'm having to seek out relationships whereas normally I would just go to someone's desk. I'm now having to formulate virtual relationships with new people and new uh, colleagues. So I have a, a confined team but my role is very much uh, in service to everybody who could be within my organization. 
So I'm having to find people. I'm having to self-start. I'm having to look for opportunities. I'm having to search for information, which is both itself a, a challenge and an opportunity because I'm having to become more self-reliant, but I'm also finding myself becoming more capable as a researcher and as a worker because I'm able to find information more more efficiently than I have before, even though it's more challenging. But I'm also finding myself able to find new ways to introduce and connect and interact with people than I have before, just because it is a different environment. So that's stimulating, even though it's difficult. So Matab, how's it, what's, what are some challenges when you're onboarding an employee remotely? I actually started myself remotely on this job, so I can speak to that too, which again, I think echoing what Liz was saying, it's a mix of challenges, but at the same time, I think a place like eBay actually is very much used to uh, working remotely or like from different sites, so that wasn't that hard for me. Um, boarding is um, onboarding has, has been a process because I'm also like um, seeing how it's um, panning out for other folks who are joining. I think early on it was more of a challenge and by now um, everything is actually finding their rhythm and it's very much happening. Um, I think in general it's harder to establish a rapport when you haven't met your colleagues in person like ever. Um, that being said, I think you can use what you can and be creative like putting one-on-ones on, -ones on um, your colleagues schedules not to talk about that project topic that you have but just like to get to know each other a bit better just like you would have stopped at a colleague's desk maybe unannounced sometimes and just like strike conversation so it, it definitely requires a more um intentional communication and you cannot really rely on um basically accidental um running into each other's and whatnot so definitely something to consider these days is that a lot of things that would just come um with like sharing an office with other individuals those are not happening and you need to really plan everything out yourself Awesome. What about you, Eric? What are some, how, how's the process of onboarding an employee for you? Yeah, for context, I've hired about 10 people over the last three months, uh, a mix of interns, uh, full-time researchers, and then also managers. Um, challenges, I feel like the onboarding period is protracted. Everybody feels a little further behind, feels like their uptake's a little bit slower. Uh, the other thing I've noticed is kind of have to manage their expectations around this diminished sense of accomplishment. It's like I'm, I'm putting in the hours, I'm trying to learn, but it doesn't feel like I've had the same impact as I might have had in my prior job or when I was working in person with a team. And I, that's something I've even personally experienced. Sometimes I get to the end of the day and I think, gee, you know, what kind of business value did I generate today? Um, Positives, I see a really overt commitment to emotional health and psychological safety, just a general level of care in, in personal relationships that I think was sacrificed when the business of business was to you know, get things done. Um, and so I just think, I think we see uh, more of people's whole lives when they're vulnerable at home, sharing their camera on Zoom. Um, a little more responsive to messages, which is a good and a bad thing. Like you gotta be mindful of their, their work life synergy because the boundaries blur. And then I think for the distributed teams, there's just less of the one person feeling like they're the odd person out because they're remote from everyone else. You know, we're all in the same boat and we kind of celebrate and commiserate over that. So yeah, we'll move on to a different question now. Um, what changes or improvements would you like to see as an interviewee, a new hire or a manager? And we'll start with Hannah on this one. Okay, um, I definitely hope to see more companies taking UX more seriously as a valuable asset. And I've noticed while interviewing, there's 
the companies that are thriving, like Google, Amazon, IBM, Dell, um, those are the people that nothing has changed with the interview process. Um, they're still posting stuff all the time. Um, they're adapting. Like I know Twitter is remote, I think indefinitely um, or for a long time. Um, so just seeing those companies just pick it up and adapt um, is, is really hopeful to me. Um, but it's also amazing to see um, this industry, how, how people really undervalued UX and now everything changing so fast. Um, I think companies are taking it much more seriously and it's now a must have and not a nice to have. So I, I think in the future, we'll, um, we'll definitely see that pick up. Um, if it hasn't already in that company, there'll be companies that are like, what are they doing? And um, it'll be, there'll be more opportunities for people. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, how, what changes and improvements do you like to see? Um, so I think the changes are trending towards the positive. Um, like Hannah was saying, the companies that adapted well to the situation early on um, seem to be doing pretty well. And um, I think just a continuation of that trend, just realizing that, you know, this is the way things are right now. We're going to have to interview and onboard people remotely. Um, so I think just a continuation of that is, is a positive. How about you, Matab? What would you like to, what, what changes or improvements would you like to see? A hard one. Um, I mean, I think a big part of it is seeing this more as a as an opportunity, which sometimes is hard when you're looking at some of the things that are happening in the industry. These are not the best days for certain companies. Um, but I think I think it's all of us on all of us to to work within the community and ex continuing to expand our network and get to know new people. So I think like. If we are marking this period as a period that's a bit different, we can make it different for some good reasons, including um, coming together as we do sometimes when there are these, for example, big layoffs in some of the companies, at least in the area, we actually see a lot of hiring managers, managers a lot of companies, uh, and a lot of like people who can do services, like even, even things like connecting you to other folks or reviewing your resume and whatnot like these are things that bring us together and create more opportunities down the road so to me maybe the point is really having the short term and long term of it both in mind as we're going through this this very unique phase mm -hmm. awesome um liz what would you like to see what improvements would you like to see so I'm, I'm going to answer this question as someone who used to hire someone in my previous role and also someone who has just been hired. Um, really, what I would like to see are better ways to familiarize individuals with their teams and their team members and also their work, how to properly connect them to what they need to accomplish and who they need to accomplish it with. I know that as someone who helped hire and onboard a new individual just before they left their previous role and is who, who is basically being ramped up as um, a new individual very kind of slowly and who is having to make more of those intentional connections, um, it's not easy and so companies even bigger companies who are well equipped to make these kind of interviews and hires and who have been prepared for a situation somewhat like this one, um, we're still having to make those purposeful connections. What comes after the interview is still something that's having to be treaded lightly and still having to be very intentional and still being focused on. So that's always something that could be improved upon is having to be very intentional with who we're speaking with and how we're bringing them into the fold. Awesome, awesome. What about you, Eric? 
I'll talk about four things that we've implemented. Uh, one is have the hiring managers do the first conversation instead of recruiters. Um, Cause I think that sometimes the recruiters don't, aren't able to represent the, the culture and kind of the authenticity of the team and, and the work that really needs to get done. And so I think it's important that we uh, communicate that earlier rather than later. Uh, building on something Hannah mentioned earlier, scheduling time for like a social slash cultural fit, just as if you're on your on site and you're gonna go have lunch in the middle of you know five interviews or whatever. Um, just giving people time to um, get to know their potential teammates and stakeholders without the pressure of uh, question answer format. Uh, building on something Liz actually just mentioned, one of the things we started doing is we started making like a uh, custom welcome websites for our new hires. It's built on a template. So it's not like we're building a coding a website from scratch every time, but a way of introducing them to their stakeholders, making them feel like we invested some thought and care in preparing for them. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're about to put on those websites is uh, a welcome video. So I asked my team to all respond to different questions. Like, what do you wish you knew on your first day? Why did you join? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that they can get like a nice candid video. It's not produced at all. It's like B-roll footage of people on their webcams. God knows what's happening behind them. And you get to see the real like unfiltered uh, culture, if you will. So those are a few things that we've done. Awesome, awesome. And we have one, one final prepared question and I just wanna remind everyone if they have any questions to go ahead and add them into the chat and we'll get to them after this one. Uh, but what advice would you give people who are looking for interviews or are looking or interviewing right now? So Michael, what, what kind of advice would you give people looking for an interview? Um, I think just from uh, what worked for me personally was just uh, being ready and willing to adapt. Um, the situation is changing rapidly and it's pretty uncertain. And um, I think just being prepared to adapt really helped me in the interview process. Um, you know, both the interviewers and the interviewees are dealing with an uncertain situation and um, trying to meet in the middle there helped me out a lot. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Matab, what, uh, what advice would you give people interviewing right now? Um, I think like maybe the most important thing is setting your expectations right, knowing what you can glean in different parts of the interaction and really using those moments. Um, I think when we had more of a habit of bringing folks on site or having like the on site in person interviews, we could. Um, we could rely on different aspects of the interview process to, to learn what we wanted to learn about the job, about the culture and all that. And now I think we just need to be more purposeful as we're doing that. We need to use different cues sometimes. We maybe need to ask certain questions more directly. And we might have to even go talk to folks that we know in the company that are not directly on, 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 a, on a team we're interviewing with, really trying to use all of these different channels to gather information and make up for the missing like, human moment that uh, we would normally have in like in-person interviews. So I think that's a big one because um, in any case, we're signing up um, for hopefully a few years at least of working at a company with a, with a new team. So it's important to, 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 to acknowledge the gaps that we might be left with uh, given the new like model of interviews and really again like taking it taking it seriously enough to to, to compensate for those basically awesome. those are some great points um hannah what advice would you like to give so to kind of sum it up i would say be patient which is something that i really struggle with um, um Current, when I was at Exxon, um, oil and gas was doing not so great before this COVID thing happened. And that was just a perfect storm for disaster. And I would say um, I went through a whole roller coaster of emotions of being really stressed, um, 
worrying about, am I going to be laid off tomorrow? What's going to happen with my team? Um, Because there was a lot of panic around that before the COVID-19 happened. So um, I would say I was very stressed and then um, almost a sigh of relief when I was let go because I didn't have to stress anymore about worrying about what was going to happen. But then sort of panic because um, I've never been in a situation where I had to, I've never been fired from a job, never been laid off, didn't expect that to ever happen to me in my career. So sense of panic of like, now what am I going to do? Um, I have a little bit of experience. I'm not, you know, I don't have 10 years under my belt, but um, I'm kind of in this in between entry and senior level. So it's just like, okay, now what do I do? Um, but then everyone's flooding all of the Um, companies with resumes and for about two weeks I didn't hear anything or I got the immediate you're a good fit but we're not hiring um, email and it was like broke my heart so but then it was a flood of um, interviews so then it was just back up of okay now I got to schedule and um, time everything correctly and Um, in between that time I was going back and reflecting my projects and just really brushing up on things I had nothing else better to do with my time so I was like let's just make sure I'm super prepared Um, but I guess um, again to sum it up just be patient because there are probably 50 to 100 people applying for the same job and even though the process is faster there was companies I applied for three four weeks previously and then they were reaching out to me Um, So definitely just be patient and just remember that companies that are doing well right now or not doing well, um, but if they're still hiring, they're looking for the best um, because in this uncertain time, um, they want people that are going to be there and be dedicated. So I would just say be patient is how I would sum that up. Yeah, great points. I know a lot of people in the chat are probably happy to (laughs) hear some advice. Um, Eric, what advice would you give to people interviewing right now? Yeah, let's build on the theme of patience. Um, Interview the company and the team. You know, do their prevailing values match yours? You know, is this a place that you could see yourself building a career at, not just, you know, clocking in, clocking out, and cashing a check? Uh, I know that sometimes the urgency of a situation, the need to pay bills, may cause some of us to compromise or satisfice, but don't ever forget that you have incredible skills that, you know, any company could benefit from. And, you know, it's on you to hold those companies accountable for, you know, kind of appealing to you and providing that support. So let's say, for example, you get an offer, ask for a reverse interview. You know, if you, if you interviewed for a design job and you didn't talk to an engineer, that's a little bit of a red flag. You know, make sure that that company is actually in, successfully integrating design and engineering. Or if you're interviewing for a user researcher job and you didn't talk to a product manager, go talk to a product manager or go talk to an executive. I don't care if you're going for an internship or a, you know, an entry level position. So, um, you know, just r- remember that, uh, you come in with that level of confidence, uh, companies will notice and, you know, do the normal stuff, send the thank yous, you know, we may not respond to thank yous, but at least your name comes back in our inbox and we're like, Oh yeah, that person, I remember them. Uh, or like you're in the interview process. Don't be afraid to show your screen. You know, Hey, we're all remote now. Instead of just talking about something, show me something, right? Like everybody, uh, I feel like sometimes, the design job, or even in user research, we talk too much, we interview people. But that doesn't mean that we can't scaffold that conversation by externalizing and sharing things, sharing models, sharing work that help us have a more intentional discussion about what our goals are. So, uh, you know, pay that forward. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid to take that step in uh, differentiating the way you handle interviews and questions from some of those other people who are just going to give the same same responses as 90%. Yeah, great points, great points. Uh, what about you, Liz? Uh, what advice would you give people? 
I would say that so far everybody's given fantastic advice so make sure you're taking notes but also prepare do your research the types of what we've mentioned before human connections where you can show your thought process you don't necessarily have the benefit of doing that because not everybody's going to do a zoom call when you are able to maybe write something down or whiteboard it out for everybody during an interview process that's face to face or even digital. So you want to be very clear and intentional about the answers that you're giving. So you want to be able to walk through like a tough situation or a complicated answer that's very clear, that's very straightforward, that shows your thought process. And you can even be wrong as long as you're clear about why you're taking back an answer or why you're changing your certain thoughts. But as long as you're intentional and you can show those thoughts by talking out loud, that's what's important, that preparation, giving that situation, that star method, that task, that, um, that analysis, that result, whatever it is, that action, the result is as long as you're clear about what you're doing, why you're doing it, or why you would make certain changes based on what you've spoken aloud, who's talking to you is looking for how you think and how you interact and how you are reactive and how you're proactive and what you've done in the past. So you have to be very intentional about those types of situations. Awesome, awesome, great points. Uh, thank, thank you everyone for answering my, my prepared questions I had. Um, I'm gonna start, you start giving some questions from our audience. Um, and so with this one, uh, it pertains to uh, our hirees, our people hiring. Um, with the flood of the new talent in the market, how are you finding potential candidates and narrowing them down? And have you, has your process of selecting criteria changed? So we'll start with Eric. I'd say my short answer is no. You know, we, we generate positions based on organizational needs. We define what that person needs to be able to bring to the table from day one and, um, and then evaluate candidates against those criteria. Uh, so I'll, I'll give that simple answer and let other people, you know, maybe explore other angles. Oh, what about you, Matab? I think it's very similar. I, I don't. I think the the way we we define needs and we define job descriptions and go about hiring is all the same. The way we go through, even I mean, if we have three resumes or if we, if we have like three hundred, we basically we comb through them with that same eye of is the right experience, background, interest is there. And we would just go through the same phases of like narrowing down, starting with having conversations and all that. I don't think that has changed um, by a lot. And I think like, yeah, I don't, I don't have the numbers. I don't know how, how is like the demand and um, supply matching at this point. But I think for the most part, our recruitment business is as usual. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, I'll jump in and say one more thing, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in and say one more thing on that. Uh, one of the things I'm doing is I'm getting my staff a little more involved in evaluating, evaluating candidates and, and, you know, bringing references forward. So in the past, we may rely quite a bit on recruiters, but I feel like the stakes are raised now. And so we, we, we managed the hiring process a little bit tighter. So I think the take home for you guys is sometimes when you get laid off from a company and you have, you know, uh, a bunch of teammates that go to different companies, that's actually a good thing because it expands your network or you're, you're coming out of a grad school program and you got, you know, students going to all these different companies, you know, stay connected to them because oftentimes these jobs will be filled before they even hit the public, you know, I'm going to go crawl LinkedIn or a, a job site. So, um, you know, some of those uh, golden paths will help you. Great, great points. Um, so uh, I think this can kind of go to everyone or whoever wants to answer it, but what are some 
tips to help someone's uh, resume kind of stick out or their profile stick out? Uh, I know Hannah had, you said you had a, a flood of interviews. Is there anything that you thought might have stuck out on your resume? Yeah, so definitely um, instead of sending my resume, even though it was tempting, just to send it to everyone. Um, I read an article that um, was talking about, I have to go back and find it, but um, companies that are hiring right now are really, um, they want to make sure that you're also invested, um, that you're not just taking this in the short term because maybe you got laid off with no intention of leaving that position. Um, so I definitely have really taken my time to come through um, different job positions and reading through what they're asking for. And if I have those positions changing or those skills changing my resume slightly to, um, to tailor to that, I'm not sure behind the scenes with all these resumes coming through if they're looking for certain buzzwords or you know how how it gets passed the to the first person or if they read them all. Um, I definitely think for some companies it's a lot it's more of a computer um, based um, software because I've gotten emails almost immediately saying you are not a great fit. So I'm like, how did you look at my resume that fast? Um, so definitely really intentionally applied for places um, because I wanted, one, I wanted to really be a fit for that. Um, and I've also applied for places that maybe I'm underqualified for, um, but wanted to use my um, skills to stand out during maybe an interview. Um, but I really, really looked at what they're asking for and made sure that I put that those things in my um, in my resume because I wanted it to stand out. They're looking for someone that's really good at usability testing. I'm going to put that on there and highlight that because I want them to know that I have that skill. They don't know me besides this piece of paper until they talk to me. So you have to really paint a picture of yourself with that one page um, before you even get someone to talk to you. So um, just be really um, intentional. And with this extra time, take the time to do your research. I know someone mentioned that and really understand what they're looking for because if they ask you a question and you say you have that skill, um, make sure to be prepared to answer that. Um, and also one more thing, I thought it was interesting in one of my interviews, someone asked me about a professor at the University of Clear Lake. Um, I'm sure most of you know Dr. Perez, um, which I did not have as a professor, but randomly that was a question and um thankfully i know who she is so i could answer it but i feel like they were trying to trip me up like do you know this person do you have classes with her um so yeah you just never know whatever's on your resume they can ask you anything about so um definitely just be intentional tailor it don't just send your resume to everyone um and definitely just comb through it i would say awesome great advice great advice uh, what about uh, Matab? How would you? What would? What advice would you give someone giving their resume to you or somewhere like that? How would they stand out? Uh, well, it, when it gets to me, it's a bit different. Um, it's different whether the person who's like doing the first task is a recruiter looking for a few buzzwords. Understandably, they wouldn't know everything about the job. Or if they are, they are a researcher or like a research manager, someone who knows the type of work that you're talking about. So I think having these in mind, um, a lot of people on the call today are human factors or user experience researchers. Look at your resume with that same lens. If it's different people, different perspectives, different amount of time to read through. Uh, how, how would I design it so that the most important things about me, my strengths, the things that I bring to the table, shine through the most easily? So you don't, you don't want to have like the most important things towards the end of the resume. If you're someone who has a PhD or other publications, you can feel free to include those, but make sure that the, that, that the more relevant information are, are shared first and then you get there. So make sure that, I mean, again, I, I don't think the resume has to be anything fancy or has to be a very like like a certain um, length or whatnot, but just be aware of um, the lens different people take when you're looking at your resume. Make sure you highlight again what's more relevant, that what's like more interesting, what's more unique about you, and the experiences that would think the next person, uh, you know, you you actually bring in something valuable to their team. And to Hannah's point, it could be different for different roles. 
um, I mean, it, it could be that you are actually someone who's applying for a variety of different roles because you have that breadth in your skill set. So maybe, yeah, maybe one um, version of the resume is not going to cut it for all of them. So have that in mind too. But again, just like run it by a few people even. Like if you have someone in your family who's unfamiliar with your, with your type of work, see if they can make sense of it. See if they can actually like put a few things together at the same time if you have like old colleagues, friends, co classmates who are like very familiar with the domain, see what they think of your resume too. Awesome, great points. Uh, Eric, is there anything that you, you have uh, to add for people to stick out? I'd say the cardinal sin for aspiring user researchers is to just list out methodologies that they're familiar with or um, to maybe they've only had a few entry level jobs. They just say, yeah, I did a usability test here or there on this product. Got to focus on results. And I tell all my researchers, their job starts after they've completed the study, after they've delivered the findings to their stakeholders. What have they done to take that data, turn it into direction, turn it into decisions? Because we run a service, right? We rely on other people to pass the benefit of our work out to our customers, to our end users. Um, so, you know, look through, just like you're designing a survey, look through every question, everything you put on there and say, what was the impact of this? Don't just talk about what you did. Um, and then I'm someone who appreciates a little bit of flair or a little bit of personality. You know, you, you sift through a bunch of uh, resumes, you only look at them for 10 seconds each. It can get you know, uh, pretty uh, repetitive. So things like, you know, one time I was looking at a uh, resume and someone, instead of writing like education, they wrote debt. You know, it's like, hey, I, I, here are all my, my student loans from this university, from that university, or like uh, back in the day when people actually would, would recontact you from a resume, um, I, uh, I did my resume in, in Illustrator and in the section where it said like contact me or my email address, if someone clicked on that, which you know they want to because it looks like a hyperlink, it would open up their uh, email client and, and, and they would pre-populate the subject field, Eric, we need you on our team, you know, with my email at the top. So it's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch them like that. I'm gonna hook them with just little things like that. It's like all the Easter eggs you guys see in your TV shows and everything. Like just, you gotta stand out just a little bit. Um, so, kind of, kind of with that, you mentioned methodology and stuff. Uh, we had a, we have a question in the in the chat saying, uh, "Are since since COVID nineteen, have there any been any, has there been any change in the kind of methodology that you are looking for, such as like quantitative skills or qualitative skills? Uh, is there is is any of that weighed differently during this during the pandemic? Uh, we, uh, either Matab or Eric." I'd say it's position specific uh, and it should be articulated in the job post. If the company didn't take the time to modify their template for a job post and give you a real representation of, you know, what they need you to be good at, skip it. Go look for a better company that spends more time in, you know, uh, communicating that externally. And then obviously make sure that you're prepared to address those things that, that are in the post. Yeah, <laughs> great, great, great advice, great advice. Um, so that, uh, this one, this one can apply to everyone. How important is networking and connections? Um, and uh, how did, has that helped you to get a job or help, helped you to hire anyone? And I think I'm gonna start with Elizabeth because you're at Taiwan and then you've gone to Alexa some pretty big companies there. So I wonder if networking has helped you in there. Um, for my particular transition from Taiwan to Alexa, I didn't rely on networking. But when I was looking at the first team I was considering, they did ask me the same question that um, Hannah mentioned, like, do you know this person? Because I was connected with them on LinkedIn. So I, I do have other friends who have made the transition from even Chai One 
to Alexa, um, to Amazon. I did not rely on them for this particular process, but I know quite a few people who, to break into one of these bigger companies, do rely on networking heavily, and they do rely on those internal networking mechanisms as a bigger company to know who these people are, what type of character they would bring, are they representative of certain values and tenets of the company. So in my particular search, I didn't, but I know that it does help and make it easier in certain situations for recruiters to contact you. Thank you, great points. Uh, Michael, has how, how important is networking and connections to you? So um, I had a pretty similar situation. Um, for this particular job that I just got, um, I didn't rely on networking, but um, you know, everyone that I talked to that uh, got hired recently for the most part, um, networking has been crucial for them, um, but just not in my specific situation. Um, so now I have another kind of a broad question for everyone. Um, oops, just lost it. Um, for, for someone that like, they've seen a whole lot of their applications have been more to a more senior role. Do you have any advice for someone that's more entry level? Um, we'll just go with Matab. Uh, I think it's really looking for the right opportunity. Um, in my team right now and previously at Apple, we always had room for different levels. Uh, we appreciated the more junior team members, uh, and then we we took the time to help them develop into like more established and like then senior members and the managers. So we we actually were looking for all the different levels, and that was something that I think was reflected in our job descriptions. And now at eBay, I think we have same so part of it is just like looking for the jobs that make sense and if you're looking if you're looking at a job description and it's about like this one established person to come and be the only ux researcher for example in a newly found company that's probably not for you uh to to throw your hat uh, in the race so just like being careful about what you're signing up for because like a big part of being junior is that you're at a point where you have a lot to offer but also a lot to learn so make sure that actually you, you position yourself within a team with enough more established researchers and enough appreciation for you that then you will have opportunities to learn and grow. So again, I think with enough of the companies out there, there is, um, there is actually a need and a desire for like junior members to, 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 to join the teams, but don't disappoint yourselves by uh, sometimes ignoring, maybe wishfully, some of these details about the level of seniority that's desired across the different job posts and just like keep getting the non so pleasant rejection letter just because you're not really applying for the right position. Look for places and then back to the point of networking, that's a big thing too. Um, to me, networking is best done where you, when you're actually not looking for a job. Honestly, probably at that point, you have an agenda that's a bit too specific. But use, a, use the different opportunities to do that. And that is also something that can help you because a lot of times I get these requests, not, not only for UX researchers, also like designers and engineers. And these are junior people. If I don't have the type of uh, position in my, my own team, I can connect them with others. So they use me as part of their network to get connected to, to people that I know are like really have the willingness to spend time on a call and really like do that type of like hand holding and introduction to this like line of work. So I think it's a bit of like knowing where you are and what can help you at that moment. And also like using different methods to land in a place where you can actually grow. And then like after a few years, you'll be that senior person doing the handholding. Awesome. Great points. Great points. Um, don't, so set, don't set that ceiling for yourself. Let the company decide if you don't have enough experience or they don't want to interview. Don't make that decision for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that as well. Um, going back to reading the job position, 
probably you're, you don't have every skill that it's looking for. Um, but if on there, there's a lot of things that you do bring to the table, even if it's asking for something more advanced, it's up to the company too to do their research on you. And if they look at your resume and they see that you only have one to two years of experience or you're just graduating, they can make that decision if they want to talk to you or not. Um, so I wouldn't, like Eric said, limit yourself um, because a lot of things can factor that in. Um, when I transitioned from HP to Exxon, they were actually looking for an advanced researcher and I only had a year and a half of experience. Um, but just alone on the university I graduated from, um, go UHCL, um, it was enough for them to say, I know a lot of people from that program and you, I know that if you graduated, you come with a lot of skills that maybe other people don't have because they went to a different university. So again, I wouldn't set yourself so low. Um, again, um, there's a point brought up, you know, if it's running a whole team, maybe that's not something you should apply for. But just because someone says senior, um, I would definitely just take the time to read through it. Um, because sometimes that means a bachelor's with three years of experience or a master's level can um, be more senior level. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't limit yourself just because of the title of the position. I would read through it and do some research. Awesome, great advice. I'll tell you something else that I've done. Um, sometimes I've put silly required skills in our job posts just to kind of poke fun because there's, there's so many like UX unicorns, job postings and, and people. And I feel like, like sometimes, for example, in our post, I put the ability to create a dendrogram on an Etch-a-Sketch. All right. So, if you don't know what a dendrogram is, it's a, it's a diagram for modeling like hierarchical relationships or taxonomies. Usually you create one after something called a tree test. But um, the people who I knew were paying attention to the job post would comment on that in their application, their cover letter. And then everyone else, you know, I would know they, oh, they're firing their application off to a hundred different companies. They're not even paying attention to what I wrote in there. um i guess this can kind of go to everyone uh i don't i don't know if the ones that are higher are interviewing right now if y'all have ux portfolios that's kind of a topic that's been up um is there any pointers or tips or anything to stand out by using a ux portfolio or if the one's hiring if y'all put a lot of weight on those or you're requiring those for y'all's hiring process um Matab, do you, do you require a UX portfolio? And if you do, what are some things that can help people stand out or tips for them? I don't, but it, but it depends on what you mean by that. Like usually early on in the process, we do an exercise of going through the candidates' prior experiences, the methods they use, how they communicate, how, do, how they manage that end-to-end -end process of defining questions all the way to making the impact and all that. So that we do, but I, I, um, not at Apple, not at eBay. No, we don't require the type of portfolio that usually designers have ready from our researchers. It's a bit of a different exercise, I'd say. Awesome, thank you. Eric, do y'all do y'all require a portfolio? We don't necessarily require them, but uh, I would say probably 90% of our applicants include them. Um, and if we're talking a UX research portfolio, you know, the least interesting part of them is the end result, you know, the, the screenshots of the product UI or whatever thing that your team made. Like, it's like seeing the movie, but only seeing the last scene. You know, I wanna see the journey. I wanna see iteration. I wanna see examples of struggles and, and challenges that you've had with stakeholders. Um, but I also wanna see the pull through of the impact. So. Like I said before, don't just stop at, yeah, I did a usability test and I threw 30 issues over the fence at my design team. You know, what happened after that? Um, so, uh, not required, but uh, it can definitely help, I would say, when you're targeting those earlier career positions. Awesome, thank you. 
Liz, do you, did you happen to have a portfolio? I don't. I put together a presentation of uh, notable examples of my work, but I don't have like a pre-existing standing website where people can go to it. I, I Some of my work requires that I don't put it on a website and some of it requires that I talk through it. So, I mean, I think there's a delicate balance of what you can and cannot as a researcher, depending on what you've done and what you do. Um, and I don't think it's always required. I think it's about what type of methodology can you clearly explain the work that you've done, why you've done it, and what would or could you change with hindsight, the benefits of hindsight. So I think it's exactly what Eric and Ma probably explained is, what what can you articulate? What is the journey? Awesome, thank you, great points, good advice. I uh, would add just a quick thing that yeah. I've heard this ask for UX researchers to have a portfolio and I'd say it's mostly when the recruiter you're working with is also a design recruiter. That's something that I've noticed. They would, they would think that just naturally you being a UX person, you need to have a portfolio. That's a in a lot of cases something you can clarify with them. But that's sometimes like the first question they ask you, just because that's their template. And I and again, like if you if you ask them and they they go ask the hiring manager, in a lot of cases that's not even required. Just wanted to put this out there. Awesome, thank you, um, Mike. Did you have, did you happen to have a, make a portfolio or anything like that? No, um, I don't have one. And um, just to echo what others are saying, um, I just tried to focus on being able to verbally walk through the, the process, walk through the studies that I've done, the, the methodology, and then um, the impact at the end. What about you, Hannah? Did you have one? So I don't have a portfolio, but the jobs that I've applied for and have gotten to that stage where they want to see something more tangible, they've asked for that to say, show me X amount of case studies. Um, because what they're really looking for is to see how you present your data and how you took ownership. Again, going back to the very beginning of the conversation, the we and I, um, which is something I struggle with. I don't want to say I, I, I the whole time, um, but companies want to hear that in an interview. They want to know that you took ownership of something, that you led this part of the research or that you made this decision. Um, so I would say I don't have one on hand, but when I've got to that part of showing off my skills, they have the companies have outlined, we want to see X, Y, and Z things from you. Um, and they're going to ask a million questions about it um, in the interview part too. But um, I would say most companies, when they want to see something like that from a researcher, they, they give you time and they're asking for something specific to show um, for that. So I have presented, but I don't have like a portfolio just for someone to look through um, at any given time. And I would say typically they aren't asking to keep those examples. They're asking for them in a presentation setting. Um, so that you can talk through those examples, but they aren't keeping those examples. Yeah, that's a good point. They want to see, and I know with my presentation, me personally, I don't have everything in there. Um, one for protect, proprietary, you have to take things out. And even if you're going to talk high level about something, it's hard to just read it. You have to be the one narrating it, um, even if you're gonna speak high level. So it doesn't really make sense on its own. Um, it sort of does, which is a struggle because I um, definitely gave my presentation to some of my friends um, and coworkers, our previous coworkers to um, go through. And my designer friends were like, this part is missing. And I'm like, okay, I have to talk about that out loud. I don't wanna put that on paper. Um, so there's definitely a balance with that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for all y'all's feedback. Um, I think those are all the questions we have. And thank you all again for all y'all's feedback. And I'll turn it over to Christy. 
Hello. Thank you, everybody. I think this is really great. I think um, anybody who's listening hopefully got some great takeaways there. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Matab for coming here and doing this on her birthday. Happy birthday, Matab. Uh, really Happy appreciate birthday. that. Yay. Happy Thank birthday. You. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, just to wrap up, if anybody has um, any final words of wisdom, feel free. Uh, I'll give you a second. If not, Liz, did you always take advantage of a gathering to mention that it's your birthday so <laughs> people can praise you for it. <laughs> she did not tell me. My daughter told me, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Michael, Hannah, anything else you want to say? Any parting words? Um, definitely, I'm available to speak. If anyone has questions later on or wants help with anything, um, I'm definitely really friendly. So don't feel shy to reach out to me. Um, I can put my LinkedIn um, in the chat, um, but you should be able to find me. Um, definitely reach out. Don't be shy. Same for me. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I and, um, we have openings at eBay too, if anybody is interested in coming and working with us in San Francisco or San Jose or Seattle, there are different options. Well, there you go. Somebody had put in the chat who's hiring. So if they've uh, stayed along to the end, there's a good tip for you. Okay, um, again, I just wanna thank everybody. Um, I wanna thank Andy for, um, hosting this for us and um, everybody who was involved in setting this up. Landon, thank you for moderating. Great job. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Robin for handling the RSVPs for us, our program manager, Cynthia. And I also wanted to thank Liz Rodwell for posting in the Houston UXPA. Um, they have some good stuff going on over there. If you're in the well, now that everything's remote, you can just go check out Houston UXPA because they have some upcoming events that are also related to this topic. And I wanna thank um, Pete Kruthoff for um, hooking me up with Eric and Angie for introducing me to Matab. So um, thank you everybody, I really appreciate it. Um, there's all the information about our chapter. And you know, anybody who's here, um, reach out, ask, add people on LinkedIn. You know, um, I think networking and connections are really important. So take advantage of um, places and uh, um, events like this to add people. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you all. Thanks. Bye. See ya.